Okay, so let's begin. So um, I was invited, um, golly, was it back in November? I can't remember, but Eric Curran's invited me to share um, some of the experience that I had learned over many years working with the Forest Trust, uh, TFT, and looking at how do we help businesses and NGOs enact what I call earth-serving actions. I try and stay away from the word, the term sustainability, and I talk about earth-serving actions. So I made this presentation uh, at the International Business Week that Avans had, and um, and we got some great questions and some lovely engagement. So I thought we'd share this presentation again um, as part of this course, because it does talk about these complex supply chains and navigating through pretty difficult problems. So. I just wanted to comment on this concept of earth serving actions. Um, I feel that the term sustainability has become so stretched to become absolutely meaningless. You know, people use it in marketing and uh, it, a lot of greenwashing. So I tend to talk about earth serving actions, which help humans and help the more than human world, which is this term that I've, I've learned and I, I, I place great value on. And that's that's other species. Um, you know, the land, all these things, and, and help the earth, basically. So we start thinking about very complex, wicked problems like human rights issues, forest conservation, ocean plastics, pollution in general, the ozone layer, climate change. These are all complex, wicked problems. And, of course, you, the students, you know, all you students are working on this whole question of the apparel industry and a lot of these things with human rights abuses, environmental issues um, are present there as well. So... I've done a lot of these presentations in the past trying to share my experience. And what I've learned is that I I think it's valuable to share the key finding of the presentation up front, just in case people get bored and they can't stay through the whole thing or they've got other commitments. And I, I love this small poem, which is by Hafiz, the Sufi master from around the 1300s. It's just a verse from a poem. And it says, I wish I could show you when you are lonely or in darkness the astonishing light of your own being. And I love this small verse because the conclusion that I've drawn after 20, 25 years of working to try and bring change in some pretty complex situations is that we have all that we need, in fact, and that we ourselves are the key catalysts, the key vehicles by which we can bring change. So that which is you, that which is uniquely you, is all we need, and we need to live according to who we are very, very uh, strongly, and that helps us bring change. And hopefully as we go forward, I'll explain that and, and that'll become clear to you. So I talk about the big seven with TFT. So the TFT was started in 1999, March 1999. And, and those of you from Avans who know Eric, uh, Eric Currens, Eric was at that stage the, managing, uh, the general manager of Quantum, the, the Dutch retail chain. And Quantum was attacked by NGOs there in the Netherlands, um, and there was a campaign against garden furniture, wooden garden furniture across the whole of Europe um, across the summer of 1998, in fact. Um, and we launched TFT in response to that campaign. Global Witness, uh, a UK-based NGO, had found that the booming garden furniture trade that was flooding European retail stores and European homes with wooden garden furniture made from tropical timber, all that all of the timber had been ripped out of the forests of Cambodia and trucked across the border into Vietnam. And there'd been terrible human rights abuses uh, and also great environmental destruction. And so there was a large campaign to try and uh, see the garden furniture industry improve its practices. And as an importer of that furniture, Quantum was targeted, and Eric led the push to say, well, we need to do something about this. And that led to the start of the TFT in March 1999, and we set about the next two years trying to convert the industry into one that was using um, certified, FSC certified, uh, sustainably sourced wood. Um, on we went to, uh, having done that, we, we did that achievement. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit detail in a minute. But then um, there's seven major projects, which I'm going to talk about in some some detail, not great detail, I'm mindful of the time, um, over the coming years. Um, to 2003, 2004, we had um, wood, wood projects in uh, Indonesia and then in the Congo Basin. And then we moved into palm oil, 2010, 11, pulp and paper, 2013, with Asia pulp and paper. And then Wilmar, the world's largest 
palm oil company in 2013. So I'm going to give us some details about these journeys and these experiences, trying to share some of the lessons that I learned along the way. Now, I'll just get rid of that little thing so you can see, there it is. So down here, I hope you can see it says forest. So I'm just going to do this. And for those of you who do, that have done the little course in the pond, this will be familiar with you. But I just wanted to give you a picture of the garden furniture supply chain as we encountered it in 1999 when we started the TFT. Oh, hold on. What's going on here? Click. What's going on? I can't. There it is. I've worked out how to click it. So basically, the 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 logs from forests across Cam in Cambodia, but also across the whole of Southeast Asia, were being sent to factories in Vietnam, and they were paying money for for those logs. Then the the, the logs were being converted into furniture and sent to retailers in Europe, for example, like Quantum. And they were paying money to the factories for the privilege of buying that furniture. Um, the furniture that was then sold onto the consumers, and uh, they were paying money to the retailer. So this is just a, a not particularly unusual global supply chain. Um, factories, uh, forests in Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Indonesia, Malaysia, supplying logs into factories in Vietnam, retailers in Europe, consumers across Europe. Okay, so this could be also an apparel supply chain, obviously different different types of factories, different locations, but just a typical supply chain. How is it working? Well, down here, you see these three lines down here. These represent middlemen and traders. And these traders were bringing the logs from the forest. And often they passed through one and another and another. And they were all related, typically uh, Chinese trading companies. And, um, and they were basically bringing the the logs to the factories because the factories didn't have the logistical skills to do that but they would often um, make up the documents of the to conceal the origin of the of the logs and they would trade the logs between themselves adding you know 10 or more percent commission each time so by the time the factories got the the logs from the forest uh, they paid quite a lot of money for them and that money was kept inside the, the companies of these trading companies. Um, sim similarly, between the factories and the retailers, uh, there were trading companies as well. And um, the main one that started the, the TFT was a Danish company called Scancom. They were the biggest furniture trading company and they were responsible for sourcing the furniture from the factories, quality control, and getting it shipped to the retailers in Europe. Watching over all of this uh, were the NGOs. So NGOs like Global Witness and in, in the Netherlands, and, I, and I, I believe I always say this incorrectly, but I think it's Milieu Defensi or Milieu Defensi, Milieu Defensi, Friends of the Earth, um, other NGOs across Europe were watching this massive explosion of garden furniture coming into the retail chains and in homes across Europe. And they weren't very happy about it because they knew that it was coming from um, tropical forests, but they didn't know where. And then when Global Witness, you'll see down here where it says illegal wood, when Global Witness completed its report and its studies uh, in 1998 and identified that all of this wood had been illegally ripped from the forests of Cambodia and trucked across the border into Vietnam, um, the NGOs had what they needed. They had the information uh, that they could go and start campaigning against this industry. So they spoke to the press. Uh, of course, the press then you know, wrote articles uh, in, and in the TV, in the papers that targeted consumers, but also targeted the retailers, um, and it all became pretty messy. The NGOs likewise had their own communications to the consumers, and they went into the retail stores and they took the furniture uh, from the stores and they burnt it outside the stores on national television. It was all you know, a very... Um, strong NGO campaign against this this trade. So it was it was pretty scary stuff. Um, we, of course, you know, now we're just starting to get the, the various players in the game. We've got the consumers, we've got the retailers, but we've also got governments. Um, governments were sort of looking at all this and saying, well, what's this all about? It's illegal wood. We're not sure we, we like the look of that. And then we had governments here in Vietnam, for example. They were very supportive of the trade because they the factories in Vietnam were employing thousands of people. Um, they were generating export dollars. So you had a very positive government in Vietnam, whereas governments in Europe were saying, hold on, you know, I'm not sure we want to be associated with this illegal trade. And of course, you had government in the forest countries as well. And in the case of Cambodia, 
well, actually, I think that's another thing. If I click there, yes, so yeah, the government in Cambodia, well, it was the military and the government in Cambodia that was doing the illegal logging. So they were benefiting hugely. Um, not so much the government, but the leaders of the government were making vast amounts of money. The military were making vast amounts of money. In other countries like Laos, Malaysia, the governments wanted to see the forest harvested. So you had, you know, in this end of the supply chain, you had very um, positive governments. And up here in Europe, you had more concerned governments. Um, banks were greasing the wheels. They were providing money to all of these players in the game. The industry, you know, this this money here that goes from each player, from the factory to the forest, from the retailer to the factory, from the consumer to the retailer, this was all passing through banks. And uh, the banks were providing money to grease the wheels as it were and then there were donors foundations who are concerned about the environment about forests and biodiversity and about human rights and they were funding the ngos work um, sitting above all that you had the un these governments are members of the un and there are things like the biodiversity conventions uh, the un conventions on human rights um, and they were seeing that these they didn't have any power to do anything about it but they were seeing that in this supply chain um, all of these conventions were being threatened. The illegal logging um, and the poor forest practices were destroying forests, destroying biodiversity, but they were also having a big impact on the human rights of um, Indigenous people and local communities living in those forests and depending on those forests. So they were getting involved as well. Um, then you had, you know, as I say down here, forests and government combinations in different countries around Southeast Asia where the wood was coming from and across the Cambodians. Um, amongst all that, we said, right, let's start the TFT. We, we need to do something about this. This trade isn't a good thing for people. It's not a great thing for um, the forests, but we can't just stop it. It's not going to stop no matter how much the NGOs hang off buildings. Um, and it does employ thousands of very, very for, poor people in the factories. So, you know, we don't necessarily want to stop this, but what can we do to make it better, make it a more responsible supply chain. So that was the trigger for launching the TFT. And then when we started, we were called the Tropical Forest Trust. We subsequently changed our name to the Forest Trust. Um, and we started talking to the retailers. So I went and saw Eric uh, at Quantum. What are we going to do? He said, I said, well, okay, Eric, well, we can give you some support. So, you know, we helped him with his um, communications to the NGOs, to the press, to his consumers and helped him get a policy. And, you know, he committed, for example, Quantum to sourcing only FSC certified furniture. Um, then we started working with the factories. We needed to help the factories to put in place better systems. And then the key part about these better systems was to exclude this illegal wood here from coming into the supply chain. So we needed to put traceability systems here in the factories. And then we needed to get out into the forest, the source forests, and give them TA, technical assistance, uh, to help them improve their management to the point where they could be FSC certified. Um, we needed to talk to the NGOs, we needed to talk to the press to say what was going on, to keep them informed of our progress so that they could see that we were working on this, on this very, very complex challenge. Um, and the donors started to say, well, we like what you're doing, we'll give you some money. And then the factory said, well, we, we need your support too. Um, and the forest said, well, you know, you know, please, we need support from you as well. Um, and so the TFT became this sort of central hub that was providing support to all of the players along the supply chain. Um, but there are many people here. This is already a complex, messy um messy supply chain right it's it's a I, I say it's a dog's breakfast it's all over the place it's very very messy and uh but there's many people many players in this supply chain that i haven't included here and so there's communities for example the communities that live in and around the forests the communities who work in the factories there's local ngos in these countries there's workers in the factories there's trade unions that represent the workers not only are we talking about the national governments, for example, in Vietnam or in Indonesia, um, in these various countries, we're talking about local governments and regional governments. There's the more than human world, the, the biodiversity that depends on the forest. There's other businesses who supply not just wood, but, for example, screws and glues and varnishes to the furniture industry. And there's shareholders and investors in these companies as well. Um, there's a, there's a, you know, we could go on and on. I'm sure if we sat down and brainstormed, we'd come up with loads and loads more people. And and those that list there is really just in the, the upstream part of the supply chain. We have down here 
um, you know, consumer groups, um, ethical trade groups and magazines and all sorts of things that are trying to promote these things. So there's many players in this very, very messy drawing that aren't shown. Um, and over, overlaying all of this, there was great politics. You know, you have the, the you know the government of Vietnam was saying, well, we need to employ our people um, in Indonesia, where a lot of the wood was coming from. It's you know it's our right to clear our own forests. And of course, this is what the government in Cambodia was saying as well. And you have regional alliances. So in um, in Southeast Asia, there's the ASEAN alliance, which is a bit like the EU, but it's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and they felt that the European governments and the trade groups, the NGOs, were ganging up on them and saying, you know, your trade is no good, telling them how to use their forests. So that all came into it. And of course, there was corruption you know, in these governments. Um, There's a lot of corruption present where um, companies were getting access or the military was getting access to, to forests in national parks and places like this because they were paying money to people in high places. And of course, we had corruption from people like the the, the timber mafia, these traders, um, and and the people doing the logging in many countries. It's just the timber mafia. So what a complete mess! Um, and into that challenge we waded, um, but we did manage to sort it out. Strangely, and I could probably we could talk for hours and hours and hours in detail about how that happened. But we went out and we found a source of FSC wood in the Solomon Islands and in Brazil. And we started to bring in FSC wood and the whole industry transitioned to using FSC wood. If you go to, a, as the summer is about to unfold, you'll go now to various stores and you'll find a lot of FSC um, furniture. And this really was, took us two or three years, but the whole industry transitioned. Um, and so once that happened, we said, okay, so what next for the TFT? And we started working with Peramperitani, which is the state owned teak corporation in Indonesia. Um, they have about 2 million hectares of forest. And the, the big problem there was not so much, there was illegal logging and it was quite bad. There's a lot of illegal mafia involved. Um, but the real problem was that the rangers, the forest rangers who were charged with protecting the forests, um, carried semi-automatic weapons. Um, around 4,000 um, semi-automatic guns were carried by rangers. And what would happen was the community members who were upset because the Dutch colonists, uh, your 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 ancestors um, in in the Netherlands had gone out to Indonesia. It became an Indonesian colony, and they'd taken a lot of the land in in the island of Java from the communities to plant teak. So a lot of the communities were saying, "Well, hold on, this is our land." And so when Indonesia became independent in 1965, they thought, "Well, this is terrific. We'll get our land back." But the Indonesian government said, well, no, that's our land now, and those teak trees are pretty valuable. So, no, we're not going to give them back to you. So, really, from the 19, well, 1920s, 1930s, I don't know exactly when the plantations were started, but certainly from 1965, there was great upset by the communities that these plantations had been established on what was their ancestral, ancestral lands. So, from time to time, they would go and try and cut down a tree if they needed money. They were often incentivized by the timber mafia. And from time to time, these interactions, they, they would get caught, the rangers, it would turn violent, and people would get shot, and sometimes they would be killed. And so the teak trade from Indonesia was stained with the blood of these community members, and a lot of NGOs campaigned against that. Um, in, after about 40 years of campaigning, they hadn't got very far, um, and so we waded into that, and between 2003 in 2009, it took us six years, but we got 4,000 guns removed from the forest. And that meant that the um, since 2009, no one's been shot um, in, in the Indonesia forests uh, managed by Perun Peritani. So we feel pretty good about that. Um, won't go into great detail, CIB, Congolese Industrial de Bois, the largest forest industry in the Congo Basin for about 50 years, had refused to even talk to NGOs. But in a program from 2004 to 2009, we managed to support COB to become the first forest in the Congo Basin to achieve FSC certification. Fascinating project. Um, amongst all of that, during 2006, at, at the end of 2006, Lord Nicholas Stern published what was called the Stern Review, and it looked at the economic implications of climate change. And it was fascinating because what he highlighted there was that <clears throat> the, the, the major cause of greenhouse gas emissions, of course, was the energy sector, burning fossil fuels for energy. But surprisingly, to me at least, the second in line was 
not as you'd imagine, well, as I imagined, was going to be the transport sector, for example, all the cars and trains and planes and ships that uh, we used to get around. It was deforestation and primarily deforestation for the explosion of agricultural commodities. Southeast Asia, uh, the explosion of palm oil and in the Amazon, um, soy and, and meat and beef. And so what happened was that TFT looked at this. I looked at this as the founder and CEO of TFT and said, well, we're not touching that. You know, we're busy working away in the wood sector. But uh, the Stern Review had highlighted that the wood sector, yes, played a role, but a very, very minor role. And most of the deforestation, most of the carbon emissions from deforestation were coming from the clearance and wholesale destruction of forests for agricultural commodities, not through the wood industry. So, but nonetheless, I felt that we were working in the supply chains in a way that we really could just transfer what we were doing from the wood industry into the palm oil sector. And that's what happened. So in that was from 2006, we started looking at this, but then what unfolded was that uh, in 2010, March the 17th, 2010, Greenpeace launched, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a very famous campaign against Nestle. And uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a one minute video. I haven't included it here in the presentation, but do Google uh, Greenpeace KitKat and Nestle and you'll see a one minute video where an office worker is shredding papers and um, he, he gets a bit bored. And of course the, the strap line for KitKat is, you know, need a break, have a, have a KitKat. And um, so he opens a KitKat and inside the KitKat was an orangutan's finger. And he bit into the, uh, the finger and blood came out everywhere. It was all a big mess, very shocking. Nestle reacted very badly, threatened to sue Greenpeace, which only helped make the video go viral globally. And uh, it all went very badly. And because I'm here in Switzerland and Nestle is just 45 minutes down the road, I knew people who worked for Nestle and they contacted me and said, well, could you come and talk to us? So we did. And we'd done some work in palm oil at that stage, but not so much. And um, within two weeks, uh, I was able to mediate uh, a solution between Nestle and Greenpeace that meant that the campaign had started on March 17th, 2010. I started working with Nestle in early May 2010 and drafted for them and mediated for them the world's first no deforestation commitment, which basically meant that Nestle said that we don't want to have any link to deforestation in any of the products that we, we produce. And the focus was initially on palm oil and pulp and paper, but it's since been come um, across the whole entire company. So that was a big breakthrough. No one had ever committed to excluding deforestation from their supply chains before. Now, what was interesting about that was GAR, Golden Agri Resources, Indonesia's largest palm oil company, was the company that um, Greenpeace had accused Nestle from buying palm oil from and destroying forests in Indonesia, destroying high conservation value forests. So whilst they were campaigning against Nestle, they were also campaigning against Golden Agri Resources, the second largest palm oil company in terms of plantation area in the world, Indonesia's largest, about 600,000 hectares of plantations. And so Greenpeace campaigned against GAR very strongly. And so GAR said to me, could you help us? And so we started working with GAR in September 2010, having had some preliminary discussions since the work with Nestle. And this eventually led to GAR becoming the first palm oil industry company to make a no deforestation commitment, I call no D, no deforestation commitment, on February the 11th, 2011. And my great hope was that this was going to be a wonderful breakthrough and that uh, the rest of the industry would follow. Well, sadly, they didn't. And we won't go into that in great detail, but certainly something to discuss at another stage. But I mention it here because I think it's very relevant to your project. Um, there is a and I, I think most of you, because I know in um, in the Netherlands, there's been a great focus on raising awareness around the FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council. So I suspect most of you know the FSC, but there's also another certification scheme called the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, RSPO, which is basically modeled on the FSC and strongly supported by WWF and Unilever. And what's really fascinating about that is that it's uh, it's it's improved. I will give it credit. It has improved over the years, but around this time it was a very weak 
standard and a very weakly enforced standard. And so the palm oil, but nonetheless, WWF in particular, ranked anyone who was a member of the RSPO as basically an environmental hero. And yet the reality was you could be deforesting, you could be having human rights abuses, slave and forced labour in your supply chain. You could be destroying peatlands and still be certified as sustainable under the RSPO system. And every year WWF would make a ranking and anyone who was a member of the RSPO effectively ended up in the top 10 of their rankings. So this whole idea of making a no deforestation commitment when you could happily deforest and still be considered a hero by WWF um, meant that no one else moved. So in your, when you're looking at the, your apparel industry example, just be mindful that certification schemes aren't all that they're cracked up to be. And I would say that if you're interested in learning more about my experience and my, my findings on certification is um, I published a book on this called Beyond Certification, and it's freely available from my website. Um, I negotiated a deal with the um, with the publishers. So if you're there's a PDF on my scottpointon.com website where you can download that book and learn about certification. Certification is not a solution to supply chain problems. It can help, but it can also get in the way. Let's not talk about that anymore. That's a whole other presentation. Um, anyway, the next case was APP, and that wasn't in the palm oil sector. But what was interesting about APP was they were the sister company to Golden Agri Resources, and uh, much bigger, very, very large, you know, the, the world's largest vertically integrated pulp and paper company. And when they saw what was unfolding with GAR, the Greenpeace and GAR were talking to each other in nice terms, they realised that this was an opportunity because Greenpeace had been campaigning against APP for years, as had WWF, and APP were losing a lot of their customers in the Greenpeace campaign. So in early 2011, just before GAR made its announcement, APP said, you know, what's going on? How come Greenpeace has stopped campaigning against GAR? And the answer was because GAR has... Um, you know, Scott Point and TFT have mediated a an agreement, a no deforestation commitment, which is about to be announced. So APP said, oh, maybe we need one of those. Can we talk to you? And I said, yes, we'll talk. But unfortunately, what happened is they really weren't very serious. Um, and it took us quite a long time. I won't go into all the gory details. But I wanted to share with you um, a poem that I shared with APP. I'll just go back here in, you see, we started talking to APP in January 2011. And by August 2011, it was clear to me that they weren't serious. They didn't understand what they needed to do to make the transformation that was needed. So I wrote them a report telling them this and included in the report was this poem called Autobiography in Five Short Chapters. So I'll just go through that quickly. Um, chapter one is I walk down the street there is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I'm lost. I'm helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes me forever to find a way out. Chapter two. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. But it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three is I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It's my fault. I get out immediately. And chapter four is I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. And chapter five is I walk down another street. Now, the reason this was fascinating for me and APP, if I just go back, I told APP I felt they were at Chapter 2. This was in August 2011. They, the street that they were walking down was natural forest destruction. They were clearing vast areas of Sumatran rainforest and had been doing so for 20 years with all sorts of environmental destruction, loss of biodiversity. But they were also engaged in some pretty bad social practices and treating Indigenous and local communities um, very badly. And so this was the street they were walking down, natural forest destruction, human rights abuses. And it was a hole that they kept falling into and that they were being beaten up again by the NGOs again and again and again. They were losing customers. 
that they refused to acknowledge that it was their fault. We have the right to do this. It's Indonesian forest. We have the the uh, agreement from the government. It's not my fault. And they just kept falling in that street again and again and again. And I told them this in August 2011. A big mess. Um, so as what unfolded then was, I'll just go back here. It took us a while, but in February 2013, we had the breakthrough and APP signed the, its no deforestation commitment. It was the first pulp and paper sector no deforestation commitment in the world. What happened was that during 2000, in August 2011, when I sent them that report and that poem, they said, oh, we're not going to work with you. We hate you. They tried to sue me, put me out of business. Um, they, they didn't take it very well. But in January 2012, they called me back. And between January 2012 and February the 5th, 2013, there was much negotiation, much discussion. And APP gradually moved to understand that it was their fault. So if we just go back, they got to chapter three, um, it, they understood that they needed to change. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to change, but they understood that they needed to change. They acknowledged that they had responsibility for the problem. And in chapter four, they started to avoid some of the holes. They stopped clearing natural forest in their own concessions, but it was still being cleared in some of their suppliers' concessions. So they weren't quite there. And then finally, on February the 5th, 2013, they walked down a different street. And the different street was that they would no longer ever take um, trees from natural forest. They would only take plantation trees. So they had that window to move through to a different street. And they did it on the February the 5th, 2013. So last example, we come back to Wilmar. Uh, we come back to the palm oil sector as Wilmar, the world's largest palm oil company. They trade 45% of all palm oil in the world. And they were being attacked by climate advisors in 2013 because Wilmar, they have their own plantations, but they were basically buying palm oil from plantations that were burning the forest. And that the smoke from those forests was choking Indonesia, choking Singapore and Malaysia. And climate advisors attacked Wilmar for this. And Wilmar's response was to say, but we're not burning in our plantations. And this was true. Their own plantations are very well managed. But they were buying palm oil from everyone else who were burning. And this was a very strong campaign and it upset Wilmar very much. I started working with climate advisors and Wilmar to mediate that response. Uh, Wilmar's uh, response to this campaign. And along the way, the CEO, founder and chairman of Wilmar expressed his great frustration, you know, oh, they're attacking us, this is not good, this is not who we are, it's not our fault that there's fires, et cetera, et cetera. But he started to understand what he needed to do. He understood that he needed to um, be much stricter about what palm oil Wilmar traded, not just trade from anyone, but actually look at what those potential suppliers were doing in their plantations. And if they were burning, they needed to stop burning or Wilmar would stop buying from them. But how to do that? They needed to change the way of business. And what was interesting here was that in November, at the end of November 2013, we'd been talking a lot and the whole industry was urging Wilmar not to make a no deforestation commitment because if Wilmar went, then they would have to go down that path as well. And the chairman and founder and CEO of Wilmar, he knew that he needed to go, but he had his whole industry colleagues in his ear saying, don't go, don't give in to the NGOs. But he knew the business case. He knew it was going to have to, have to happen sooner or later, but he was stuck. His feet were stuck in concrete. So I sent him an email where I made the business case and he knew the business case because he's a much cleverer business person than I am. But I realised that I was just telling him things he already knew. So this wasn't going to help him move in any way. So I attached this cartoon from Australian cartoonist Michael Lunig to the email. And it says, at the top of the tallest building in the world sat the saddest man in the world. So this is a bit risky. I was more or less saying that, you know, here's this guy, this big business leader, um, the world's the CEO of the world's largest palm oil company, and he's the saddest man in the world. And inside the man was the loneliest heart in the world. And inside the heart was the deepest pit in the world. And at the bottom of the pit was the blackest mud in the world. So I'm painting a pretty grim picture of this guy. 
And in the mud lay the lightest, loveliest, tenderest, most beautiful, happy angel in the universe. So things weren't so bad after all. And I sent this to him and I said, listen, you've been telling me about all of the concerns you have for tigers, for orangutans, for people. You've shown me that you've got an angel in your heart, but you're listening to your industry colleagues who don't want you to take this step. But you've got to listen to that voice that's inside you and you've got to make this step. And I sent him this email and I thought, well, that's it. I've destroyed that relationship. And I didn't hear back from him for three days, which is very unusual because normally I hear, I would hear back from him within 30 seconds of any email I sent at any time of the day. And after day three, I thought, well, I've ruined it. It's all a mess. And finally, there was an email in my inbox. And there in the email was Mr. Kwok basically saying, we're going to do it. You've convinced me. And so basically, on December 5th, 2013, Wilmar became the first no, uh, the first company, uh, the first trading company um, to make a no deforestation commitment, and not just any trader. As I say, the trader, the world's largest trader of palm oil. And so, what unfolded then was that in 2014, the rest of the industry followed. So there was a great transformation in the industry where everyone committed to no deforestation. Doesn't mean everyone's. I think right now there's about 900. Um, companies with no deforestation commitments in the world. It doesn't mean they're all implementing them, but um, there's, a, there's a great transformation that, that unfolded. Um, and in 2015, um, an Australian journalist who I, I knew did, a, did an article on this. He said, how did someone from rural Australia end up being involved in all these fascinating projects? And he used this term, Scott Poynton uses unusual methods, you know, sending poetry and things like this to the leaders of some of these largest companies in the world. Um, and, you know, this is this brings me back to this messy, messy supply chain. Of course, this is the garden furniture supply chain, absolute mess, dog's breakfast. Um, here's the palm oil supply chain. And there's again, there's many, you know, trade associations, indigenous people. There's all sorts of things that are not in this supply chain. But as I looked on this during 2015 and, and later, I started to ask myself, how did it work? Why did it work? And, and, and when didn't it work? Because there were times when it didn't work, when this work that I was doing didn't work. Um, what were the lessons? And so I asked myself, who has control in these supply chain situations? Let's just go back. You know, there's the palm oil supply chain. Here's the garden furniture supply chain. Um, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, who's controlling what's going on in there? Who's controlling what's going on in the palm oil uh, supply chain? And the answer is that no one has control. No one has control whatsoever. And I ask myself, so what can you control? And, and the essential thing that I came to, the essential conclusion, the essence of my experience over these 20 plus years of being in these complex situations, these messy, messy complex situations where you've got corruption and mafia and all sorts of things, um, is that change happens deep in the recesses of the human heart, right? None of the decisions to go down the no deforestation path were governed by worries about share price. That may have got them started. You know, APP in particular were worried about losing customers. But in the end, that wasn't what drove them. All of those questions about profit and loss and KPIs and work plans, these are all matters for the head. And the decisions came, these, these major transformations of industries, not just companies, but of entire industries, came when the company leaders were able to connect with what is uniquely theirs. And that is their fundamental values, their beliefs, and yes, I would say their soul. And to act from that place, right? to act from that place that when they said, we don't want to be linked to deforestation, we don't want to be linked to the death of orangutans, we don't want to be linked to human rights abuses. These weren't questions about profit and loss. These were questions about values, about who they are as people. So the question of who has control, the only person, if we go back quickly, to this picture, there's TFT out there in the red. The only person in that supply chain that I had any control over 
was myself. And even then, I didn't have 100% control because I could still be triggered to anger when someone said something. Um, it drove me crazy. Um, so I didn't even have 100% control over myself. But I certainly didn't have control over anyone else, the smallholders who were growing palm oil, the Indonesian government, the NGOs. So I could only influence, I could only control my own behaviour. And I just want you to hold on to that for a second. We'll come back to it. So coming forward. And I, I understood that this question of values was absolutely pivotal. It was the starting point of every transformation. And when I could get people connected to those values, we were able to make progress. So what did you want? If you don't want to be linked to deforestation, what do you want to be linked to? If you don't want to be linked to human rights abuses, what did you want to be linked to? What do you want to be linked to? So this is where these policies, I would help them write their policies that said, we don't want to be linked to this. We want to be linked to that. We want to be linked to these good practices. Okay, brilliant. So once you were able to put out your policy statement, so the first, well, no, it wasn't the first step, but the first major public announcement was always the statement of values. There no deforestation commitments, no deforestation, no exploitation, no peatland clearance commitments. That were their values. So there's your values. And the next step was to say, well, how are you going against those values? And let's be transparent about that. You say you don't want to be linked to deforestation. And on these 20 suppliers, you're not. They're not doing deforestation. But on these five or six suppliers over here, they are doing deforestation. So let's be transparent about this. Let's be clear how you're going uh, against your values. And then once you understand that change is needed, these 10 suppliers over here or 20 suppliers over here, they're doing great. But these five suppliers here are not. We need to work with them. Let's engage and let's help transform their practices to be more aligned with our values. And if you're Nestle, the world's largest food company, if you're Wilmar, you have some power to influence these supply chains. Not completely. The suppliers can always say, we don't care, and we just sell it to someone else. But this was the process we started to working through. And once you're working on that, let's have some verification processes. Get someone else to tell us how we're going. Don't just tell the world that we're doing a great job ourselves. And as you go through these processes, you're going to learn a lot. So then you can feed those back in and you can add more values or you can modify your values policy statements because you're learning as you go. So this whole VTTV model became the, the essence of, of the work that we at TFT did with companies the world over. And this was, I, I stepped aside as TFT CEO at the end of 2015. I'd had enough, I was, I was completely burnt out. In 2016, I had two heart operations. But I used this time as a period of reflection and saying, you know, if big urgently needed change only happens when people get connected to their values, which is what I fundamentally believe, and if they only get to that place under stress and tension, for example, created by an NGO campaign, then we're not going to make it. It's too slow. We don't have enough NGOs with enough resources to beat up on company by company by company by company. We just don't have it. It's too slow. And in the concept of human rights abuses, in, in looking at um, ocean pollution, in, the, in, in climate change in particular, these are problems we, we need to address urgently. So we can't wait for Greenpeace or other NGOs to go company by company uh, and to get us to where we need to be. So if we want to make change go to scale, we need to find scalable ways to get people connected to their values. This is the Logical, logical conclusion that I drew from my work, sitting in these dark rooms with, with company leaders over so many years, and NGO leaders too. And we get them to act from there and to stay there, stay true to their values. The moment that there's a question we have to pay any more money, oh, no, well, we can't do that. Let's just keep using illegal wood or let's just keep using palm oil from destroyed forests. No, we need you to stay with those values. We need you to implement those values and stay true to those values. So the question came to me is, well, how the hell do we do that? How do we get people around the world at scale living according to their values? And I thought and I thought and I thought about this. I did much walking. I do a lot of walking in the forest with my dog. You know, how do we do that? 
And I wasn't getting very far until I finally realised that the path to scale was literally staring me in the face. Because amongst all of the crises and tension created by the NGO campaigns that I'd sat through, I'd, I'd been able to be the one person in the room that were able to get leaders to make major unprecedented decisions, huge company and ultimately industry-wide transformations and I, by helping them connect to themselves. And I just want to say that, you know, I, I saw an article recently come out that, you know, when I was working on this back in 2010, in Indonesia, Malaysia and Papua New Guinea, where there was over a million hectares of forest being destroyed every year. And a report came out recently that showed it was down to 37,000 hectares. Still too much. We need to get it down. But this process takes time, but it's worked. Now, nonetheless, forests are still being burnt um, as they dry out. Uh, in other countries and in, in Indonesia as well. But, you know, in terms of the supply chain transformation, this has been a very powerful process. And I managed to do that, I believe, not through any clever skill that I have. I'm not a great orator. I know more intelligent than anyone else. I'm just a young bloke from the bush. Not so young anymore, but I was a bit younger when I was doing this. And the essential thing that came to me was that I was able to help them get connected to their values and their self, their, their inner voice, simply by being connected to myself. And in, the essence, in essence, by being connected to me, I'd made it easier and safer for them to be connected to them and to start making these decisions around their values, not profit and loss. And, and I come here, and I, I won't go into it in any great detail, but there's a lovely, um, there's Michael Looney is this Australian cartoonist and philosopher. And in 1990, he published a book. And in the book, he included a man, a picture of a man praying to a duck. And um, there's a lovely introduction. I think I shared the text with the Avans team when I gave the presentation. I shared it with Eric. I don't know if he shared it with everyone um, with the introduction, where Looney explains that um, this is a man who's humbled himself because he's kneeling, he's not standing upright. And the duck is a symbol of the man's soul, of the man's inner world. And in humbling himself and praying to this soul, he's striving to get connected to it. And it's a very powerful image for me, a very simple image. And I've used it a lot in my work because it's a lot easier to talk about ducks than it is to talk about souls when you're sitting in a room full of executives um, who don't really believe in that stuff um, and they're screaming and worried and very tense about Greenpeace hanging off their building or you know, what's happening with all of their customers and you start talking to them about soul and they start you know, thinking there's something wrong with you. It's a lot easier to talk about ducks or just values. Um, but this is the essence of the message. We need these people to get connected to themselves and to start acting from that place. And it's not easy. Um, but what I learned was that if I can be connected to my duck, my inner wisdom, my voice, then it's easier for me to call forth your duck. Because ducks are wild animals, right? Stay with a metaphor here. It's a metaphor, right? Stay with it. They're wild animals. They're timid and they're shy and they don't like craziness. So when I'm sitting in the, you know, the room on the, the 36th story of the of the GAR and APP building in Indonesia, sitting with the leaders of these companies, and they're stressed out of their brain because Greenpeace and all these other NGOs are beating them up and their customers are leaving them. Um, there's no space for reflection. There's no space for pausing a moment to listen to the inner voice. But amongst all of that, I was sitting there speaking from that place within me. No more, nothing more intelligent or logical than that. And so by being able to get connected, you create a deep sense of calm. And after some months of working with me, these companies would start, you know, you, you know, it's almost, I, I would become this sort of calmness barometer for the room. So they would start calming down when I was with them. And in that calm and in that quiet, that's when they can connect, get connected to that inner wisdom and they can start to make wiser decisions based on their values as opposed to the chaos of the campaigning that was going on around them. And I call this the art of change. I call it the art of duck whispering. Some of you may 
know about the movie The Horse Whisperer, where um, Robert Redford, it's a very old movie, um, but, you know, these crazy horses and you know, this concept of horse whispering where the man was able to go in and whisper into the horse's ear and calm down these crazy horses. It's a beautiful movie. Um, and I call it duck whispering because these ducks are all very timid and shy and the soul is going crazy as everyone's stressed. Well, just by being calm in the room and speaking from your values, no, it's not okay to be linked to human rights abuses, but let's find a way forward. Let's find a way out of this place. Let's find a way that you can run your business and not be linked to deforestation. But you know your business better than I do. How do you think we're going to find your way out of here? Helping them find that calm amidst the chaos is the art of duck whispering. And calling forth what's good and essential in these people. Because the NGOs would always say, oh, they're evil, they're bad people, blah, blah, blah. No, they're not. They're just running their business in a way that's having negative consequences. And if we can connect them to who they are, then they will move and start to behave in a better way. This has been my experience. And the magic of this whole process is all we have to do is get connected to ourselves. That's the essential lesson that I learned through this journey. So you all have what you need. And of course, courses and trainings like we're doing here are absolutely brilliant and absolutely great. They can, you know, the, the work that you're doing on your supply chains, you learn so much, right? But you don't need those things alone to be a major change maker. You just need to be connected to you, to yourself, to your values, your soul, your duck, whatever you want to call it, and to act from that place. Because when you do, you inspire other people to do the same. But it isn't easy because you're being challenged and buffeted by storms. You're being triggered to anger and emotions the whole time as well. It happens in our life. So, But if you can find your way, and, and Michael Lunig in his introduction, he said, it's a lifetime struggle. And it is because you can be connected today and then some crisis happens and you get, you know, blown off course tomorrow or even you start off today and by the end by lunchtime you're in a mess you're tired you're stressed you've got worries this can knock you off knock you away from that connection so it isn't easy but it is a social and political act as lunig says in his introduction because if we can be connected to ourselves we can inspire other people to get connected to them and it is a social and political act because we were able to be great partners in the transformation of the garden furniture industry, of the Congo Basin forest industry, of Perimperitani, who was shooting people, of Nestle, of the entire palm oil sector, by simply being connected to ourselves. So it is a social and political act that we can take to scale. So my conclusion then, and my message to you is this, your work to bring change, bring change is essentially inner work it's the work you need to do to live your own life as true to your own values as you can. There's nothing more needed. Now, if you get knowledge and things along the way, brilliant, it helps. But this is the essence. And you must know those values. You must know yourself very deeply because then you'll know when you're not living true to them. As we all fail, we all fall along the way. But if we know the path to that duck, we can find it once we've been knocked away. And if you can do that, you can inspire others to do exactly the same. You trust in the good of people. The duck resides in everyone, but sometimes it gets squashed down by culture, by tough experiences in life, and we have to call it forth. And it can take longer, but we have to trust that it's there. And you've got to have faith that this just isn't some spiritual religious nonsense because it isn't. And by virtue of the fact that we, we are seeing those deforestation numbers go down, we do see 900 companies investing millions and millions of dollars in their purchasing decisions to avoid deforestation, to avoid exploitation, to avoid these various things that they don't want to be connected to. This is real. And when I stepped aside as TFT CEO, we were working in 48 countries with 260 people impacting more than a trillion dollars worth of supply chain transactions. And this was the essential 
focus, the essential way we went about it. And it's the, this is the conclusion I found after 20 years in the trenches at the frontiers. So finally, it is working. I'm seeing the change with CEOs, senior leaders, and just normal people all around the world. Do a lot of mentoring and coaching and guiding with people around this. And the one thing that I have to do is make sure that I live true to my duck. And that then inspires people to do the same. Change is happening, not as fast as we need, but I feel scale is rising. And I call it a different way of being. It's a different way of being in the world. And um, you'll, some of you have visited my pond community and you'll see the, the little, you've seen the little course that I've done there. There's more courses and there's more of this lesson sharing along the way under this idea of a different way of being. And I call it, it's just the way. And some of you will know the, 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 the Tao Te Chung, uh, which is this uh, ancient wisdom of Lao Tzu. There's, this is just ancient wisdom. Um, it's not something that I've dreamed up. It's not something that owned by me. But it's just ancient wisdom that I'm somehow managing to learn as, I, as I've gone along. And so to finish, we come back to where we started. I wish I could show you when you are lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. You have everything you need there inside you. Get connected to that, live from that place, and you will inspire others despite the complete complexity and wicked problems that we saw in those supply chains and that no doubt you're witnessing in your own work as you look at apparel supply chains. You can bring change. That's the lesson that I've learned over so many years. Just be yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think um, we're a bit speechless now. I don't know about the the rest of the people who have been listening. Are there any comments or questions? Uh, Petru did um, type a comment. Um, Petru, you want to come to to just share it with um, Scott? Yes, sure. Um, I worked as a legal counsel in a, um, a company that provided corrugated boxes. So it was a bit uh, familiar to me the situation with the illegal logging. Um, the company, as far as I know, they're trying to be as sustainable as they can because in the end they're still cutting trees, but they try to recycle paper, they try to uh, uh, source the, um, the wood from um, uh, from uh, accredited sources. One thing that happened uh, uh, is that as soon as the company would get the specific certifications, either from ISO or from um, some uh, other uh, accreditation, um, the clients would frequently ask even more audits just to confirm that, hey, are you indeed that uh, standardized or I, do, do you comply with uh, with what you got certification for and it's just a paradox as soon as you get the certification mm -hmm. they're more skeptical for some reason spot on I, I, I think you know it, it's exactly right sorry I just what was your name again Petro Petro yeah thanks Petro um, I agree with you completely. And I saw this. I, I, I didn't go into all the details, but at one stage there at the start of the TFT, I, I actually um, worked for Scancom, the Danish furniture company, because it was very clear to me that they had no idea how to transform the supply chain. I didn't either. I had no idea whatsoever, but they asked me to come and help them. So I said, well, why wouldn't you? So I dived in there. And for two years, I was managing you know, the production of all of this furniture. And we, we brought auditors in to try and verify what we were doing with the with the with the furniture i learned a couple of things one was that the auditors kept moving the needle themselves often in response to questions from customers or ngos the other thing i learned was that the auditors really had no idea what was going on either and the, the vietnamese factories were absolute experts at getting around the auditors and there was a factory that um there was a factory that i knew uh, in, in this particular month, I, I think it was November, I can't remember the year, it didn't, doesn't matter, November 2000, I think it was, that they had produced nine containers of furniture that they had shipped as being FSC certified. And I knew there wasn't a stick 
of FSC certified of wood in that furniture whatsoever. So I said to the auditors, go there. We need you to um, nail this customer, uh, this this factory. And of course, when they got there, all of the documents were in order. Everything was fine. And so the auditors were like, what do we do? You know, we weren't there at the time. We can't accuse them of lying. All of the documents were fine. Um, and so I was like, oh my, what do you do in that situation? And of course, what then happens is you crank up the controls and the whole system is based on no trust. And so you crank up the controls and so you create an incentive. You create a whole system of a, a vicious circle of more controls, more intelligent techniques to get around them, more controls, more intelligent techniques to get around them. And what we found, of course, was the Vietnamese uh, and, and the Chinese and all of these suppliers were always one step ahead. The controls would be cranked up and they'd get up there. And then, oh, and before you know it, you've got 10 staff, you've got all sorts of things running around in an impossible situation. And you get into that situation and say, well, hold on, this is ridiculous. We've got to stop. What can we do to bring trust back into this equation? And we need verification. We really do. But these certification schemes, I don't believe, are the way to do it. And um, and as I say, you know, it, it's I'm not trying to sell you anything. The book is on um, my website. It was published in 2015. I don't think it's out of date. Um, still the same problems with certification exist today. Beyond certification, scottpointon.com, download it as a free PDF. Um, you know, I'd be interested to talking to folk about what they think about it. But uh, I don't, I, I, I guess coming back to your essential question, Petru, is that for your your company, they're in a really difficult bind because their customers don't trust them and they're just ratcheting up the systems. And, you know, oh, you've got this certificate. How did you get that certificate? Prove to me that it's valid. It's like, man, you know, and it's a vicious circle. And I honestly feel some to, somewhere along the line that's going to break. What's happening now is everyone's going down the path of things like blockchain and other technological um, solutions to that. But fundamentally, the whole system is based on no one trusting anybody, sometimes with some justification, let's be clear. Um, but I think it's when, when I wrote Beyond Certification, it was to say, let's step back and let's try and understand that this system isn't working, what might we do instead? And to try, I tried to foster some discussion around that, but unfortunately, the the uh, there's too much money in certification. It's absolutely a racket, and uh, there's no incentive to change the system whatsoever. So it hasn't changed. Things like blockchain are coming, but they're very expensive. They haven't really solved the problem yet. Um, but there's some clever minds looking at it, and there's some new technological approaches. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the coming years. Not sure I answered your question, but perhaps gave you a bit more context to it. No, no, no. <clears throat> you answered. And then also, if I want to add something on top, the the companies have leverage one to another. Um, mm -hmm. We had the we had the client who asked from us, which a bit uh, not related to the uh, to today's topic, but still uh, touches the sustainability part. A company required for us to source. Uh, from sub suppliers where their majority of the board members are either majority female, majority disabled, majority LGBT community, you name all the parts. But at the same time, this company was evaluated the, the, the biggest uh, plastic polluter uh, from every industry possible. So <clears throat> at one hand, we would say, well, hold on, it's really hard to find the uh, sub suppliers which would have all these requirements. But then you say, "Oh, sorry, we cannot, we can't, we cannot accept your terms because you're at the same time uh, uh, the biggest plastic polluter." So uh, uh, they come to consensus that, "Okay, I'll scratch my uh, your back, you'll scratch mine." So it's also uh, hard with, especially with um, with huge corporations where they have leverage on each other. They do, um, and I've seen this many times. And one of the things, and, and the counter to that has been, I've seen companies say, well, my customers aren't asking for this. You know, my customers aren't asking for me to be responsible. And in both of those situations, the situation you described, but this other situation where the customers aren't asking for anything, and the NGOs perhaps are beating up the company for not doing something, but my customers aren't asking. I always just to say to people, well, what do you want to do? What are your values? Like, it doesn't matter what your customers are asking. Do you want to be linked to the death of 
uh, Sumatran tigers and orangutans and extinction? Do you want to be linked to human rights abuses? Is that who you are? So, and, and, and then you've got to bite the bullet with your customers. And if your customers are coming and saying, um, well, either we want these things or we don't want these things, well, that's not who I am. This is who I am. Here's my policy. Here's my values. So standing on the platform of who you are initially may cause problems with some of your biggest companies, uh, your biggest customers, because they might say, well, we don't care about that stuff. Um, we just want cheap product. And this is one of the things that I have, you know, with companies like Unilever. They, they tell a great job. They spend a lot of money on their communications. But at the end of the day, they just want the cheapest palm oil possible. All right. So I've, I've, I've seen this in action. I've been out the other end in the bush and I've seen the consequences of this. So there's, there's a lot of um, hypocrisy. There's a lot of investment in communications to make us look great so that our shareholders feel that we're really, really wonderful. But at the end of the day, those same shareholders will punish us if we don't get a return on their investment. So we want the cheapest palm oil possible. So there's all that. And so I used to say to companies, well, what do you want? So stand on that. And if that means you lose some customers along the way, don't worry, you'll pick up some new ones pretty quickly. Especially in this day and age where the world is turning, I believe, and particularly with COVID, everyone now is saying, well, what's your position on climate change? What are you doing on sustainability? Because we don't want to be linked to bad practices. So I think one of my challenges was I started TFT in 1999 where no one really cared about this stuff. But step by step, we got there. And I would say in the last five years only, it's become mainstream that people are saying, hold on, well, what's your responsible sourcing policy? And it's now more mainstream. There's more organisations working on it. TFT are moving away from a little bit, doing other things. Um, they're called now Earthworm Foundation. Great people, but they're, they're sort of moving into just working down on projects on the ground. Um, <clears throat> there's others stepping into the space to look at what's happening in supply chains. Um, but um, look, I think, the tide is turning in our favour that people are saying, what are you doing on supply chains? Investors are asking, customers are asking, and COVID has tipped that over. So more and more co companies, I believe, anywhere in the supply chain are going to have to stand and say, well, this is who we are. These are our values. And you can judge us, A, by the values, and B, how we implement them. May I ask you something? Because you are uh, you are talking all the time about influencing CEOs of big companies, but what about the governmental, the, the political leaders that we have? And uh, because they have, let's say, in the European Union, there's a lot of power. If they, well, we can see now the change with the labels for mm. um, appliances. Huh? They've changed. So yeah. when you. Uh, uh, so I believe they have a, a, um, a lot of influence and how, how can we manage to give politicians the courage to make these good decisions for all of us? That is a magnificent question. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's so thank you, Isabel, because this is something that I've thought about in great depth. Because at the end of the day, with the work that I was doing, was trying to tip, was trying to make a tipping point, as it were. Um, but for that, we need leaders. And so, you know, and that's what the NGOs were doing. They, you know, NGOs targeted Nestle for a reason. Nestle is the largest food company in the world. They targeted Wilma for a reason. They targeted APP for a reason. They target the big ones. They targeted COB. It's the largest forest industry company in the Congo Basin. If they went, others would have to follow. What's fascinating is that we can get those companies to go, but we don't get industry-wide transformation until regulations come down to make it, because there'll always be stragglers. And then you'll always get people who flout the regulations. But, you know, we need governments to come on board as well. And I've, I've got this crazy set of drawings where I tried to map all this out um, and, and it came to me the other day that I need to bring those out and start writing and talking about them because I think this case in the palm oil industry has been a great example because what happened in Indonesia was very relevant to this, that um, the first 30 years of the industry was clear, 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 everything, get jobs, get the plantations established, no one cared, cared about the environment. 
and they wanted jobs. And quite rightly, the, industry, the palm oil industry has been an economic miracle in in Southeast Asia. Um, created huge amounts of jobs, lifted millions of people out of poverty. This is a beautiful thing. Um, but I call it the palm oil dilemma because at the same time, it's had this terrible environmental destruction, right? But it needn't, it needn't, we didn't have both. And so for governments to start putting restrictions on palm oil industry, for example, or the pulp and paper industry, there's great risk that they would um, cause problems for, for the economic development, right? I, some vast amount, 43% of all the palm oil is grown by smallholder farmers who are very, very poor. So if you start squashing them down, you cause poverty at scale very quickly, and that can lead to riots and all, all sorts of things. So one of the challenges that I faced in this sector, in this time, um, was to try and convince governments that it was okay, because otherwise I wouldn't be allowed in the country. And so by working with Golden Agri Resources, the biggest palm oil company in Indonesia, by working with APP, we also had to do a lot of talking to the government, because the government's like, well, what are you doing? Hold on, hold on. What do you mean no deforestation? These are our forests. It's like, yeah, but the customers won't buy it. So not, you know, so you, we can keep cutting it down, but the customers in Europe and, and America, they're not going to buy it because they don't want to be linked to it. So either we deal with it now or you suffer the consequences later. Hmm. So, you know, and, and they're good people. You know, there's there's corruption too. But we we worked through that and we said, listen, we'll try and get you an example, the largest palm oil company, the largest pulp and paper company, where they will do more business and they'll do better business by sticking to no deforestation. So this, the, this is a long way of answering your questions. We had to give the government's confidence, and you use the word courage, and it's ex beautiful. It's exactly what it is. We have to give the governments the courage to understand that these changes, this instead of just exploitation, we move over to a more responsible way, a more sustainable way, a more earth-serving way. There's business in that. There's money to be made, and there's jobs to be created. There's wealth to be created. But they needed to see that journey and they needed to, needed to feel that they weren't being forced down that path by Western governments or NGOs, that it, these companies were taking this journey themselves based on good, good sense and economic planning. And they needed to lobby the government, give the government confidence, give the government courage. And so when APP went and GAR went in Indonesia, we talked a lot, the trade ministry, the finance ministry, we would go and see them all the time to update them and give them confidence that it's all right, it's okay. And so what then happened was investments came and GAR was able to you know, build more refineries. Um, they were getting celebrated. Customers wanted to go to GAR because they were making these commitments and GAR was able to show the government, look, you see, we're doing better, we're doing more business here. So the government was like, oh, maybe there is something in this. Maybe there are jobs. And so progressively over the last years, the government has been realising that, particularly in Indonesia, they can differentiate themselves from Malaysian palm oil by reducing the deforestation. And so they started putting in place policies um, and regulations and enforcing them because they had them before, but they didn't enforce them. And so government uh, companies now, there's still some deforestation in, in Indonesia. It hasn't all stopped, but it's so much more reduced because the government had the courage to put in place laws and regulations that meant that it wasn't just the, you know, the main players, it, all the stragglers had to come along as well, because otherwise they'd be breaking the law. And I, and I think this is mirrored in things like here in the EU, where um, if we're able to give the government courage to take these steps, we can put in, we can get in better regulations. But a key message on that is that it's not just about one party lobbying, the, the, the NGOs lobby the government and the NGOs don't always get it right, you know, and the industries lobby the government and they don't always get it right. We, and the NGOs. <laughs> yeah, we, we need these people to talk together because I'll tell you, for example, in I think it was 2018 when the EU stopped the uh, subsidy for biofuels with from palm oil, I was in Indonesia it was in March 2018, I believe, and I said, this will lead to an increase in deforestation. And everyone said, what do you mean? We're, we're cutting off the supply. Surely it'll lead, you know, that's less less demand. Uh, we're cutting off the demand, sorry. Less demand for palm oil, for biofuel, there'll be less supply, right? No. Why? Because most of the palm oil in Indonesia is grown by smallholder farmers, and they've only got palm oil. 
So when you drop the price, which is what happened when the when the subsidy stopped, they didn't go out and say, oh, we need to go and plant onions or we need to go and plant something else. We need to clear more forest to plant more palm oil to top up the gap. So there was a spike in deforestation in 2018 led by smallholders going out and burning the forest because the price collapsed, right? It's a, it's a classic wicked problem scenario. You think yeah. you're doing the right thing and something else happens over here that was unforeseen. But for those of us who had worked in the industry, it's like, oh, no, this is, you know, there, there could have been a better way. So we need governments to be informed not just by one lobby group or by another. We need government players to understand the complexity and the wickedness of these problems, that you can't poke it here and, you know, A will lead to B. You poke it at A, it might lead to M, Q, R and Z all at once. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah, and I think that's that's I think that's the lesson of my work as well. But giving those governments courage to take the leap is so critical. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes, may I ask a question, Scott? I mean, first of all, thank you so much. I mean, I think it is so inspiring uh, to hear uh, these experiences. It's, uh, uh, really amazing, and I think that it empowers all of us. Uh, in the sense that uh, we really see that we can be the drivers of change. Each and uh, and every one of us uh, can do that. Um, at the same time, I'm, I'm really curious, uh, how do you see reaching the tipping point? Uh, because it's really about also creating a critical mass. Uh, and what is the role of responsibility in, in your opinion? Um, as a consumers, uh, I mean, talking about uh, the apparel industry, uh, we are often considering ourselves not responsible uh, for, you know, the fate of everybody that is involved with this, uh, with this value chain. <coughs> and I think that this is one of the key issues in, in driving this change. At the same time, as you pointed out, I mean, the, the complexity of the issues, how they are, how much they are interrelated, really makes it difficult to, to intervene in one aspect without affecting sometimes in some unexpected uh, ways uh, uh, other issues and actually making even things worse rather than better. Yes. Uh, so I, I think I, I was wondering how do you see this uh, dynamics going? What what would be your your thoughts about that? Yeah. No. Thank you, Anna. It's also <laughs> it's 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 probably the toughest question, you know. And and I but I I always feel that we need to bring these things down to really um, simple things that we can do. We can each do. Each of us can do. And some of us have been fortunate, you know, luck has shone that we were in the right place at the right time to be able to be involved in some interesting processes. But that doesn't, that opportunity doesn't afford itself to everyone. But when I go into a, sh a shop to buy myself a new shirt, which doesn't happen very often because I'm a bloke, uh, my wife does that for me. Um, <laughs> but what do we, what do we decide when we go in and we, we take a shirt off the rack and we take another shirt off the rack? I'm probably one of the very rare people in the world that says, I wonder where the shirt come from, came from. How is, this shirt, how is this shirt made and how is this shirt made? And the reality is there's no information to tell me. And so what we, what we saw with palm oil, um, and I think the palm oil industry is suffering a little bit now because the information around the negative aspects of palm oil was um, um, broadcast so much that the work they've done to address those issues, which still remains to be done, but they've made so much progress, they've done so many things, but that big broadcast message has really taken the needle way too far the other way. Um, you know, so I think that there's a risk of that as well. But, you know, for example, in the apparel industry, I think it's coming a little bit. We had the Rana Plaza um, some years ago, but a lot of people won't know about the Rana Plaza and what happened there and why it happened. Um, they'll just go into the shop and say, well, this shirt looks pretty good and it's 10 uh, euros and this one looks okay, but it's 20. I'll take the 10. But the 10 came from a factory somewhere in the world where there were terrible human rights abuses. Um, and, and at the moment, all we can do is listen to the words, the advertising of the brands. H&M uh, are telling a good story, Zara are telling a good story. But for those of us who have done some work, I haven't done a lot of apparel work industry, I've done some, but I know people who do, and, you know, they just despise 
these companies because it's just all greenwashing nonsense in their view. And these are people who are sourcing from China. They know the factories um, and they just say, look, we, you know, it's, it's awful. And so I think coming back to your question, it's like we can then demand you know, we can say, we want to know. And then it comes to the companies to worrying about traceability systems and things like this. But we we need to go in there and say, look, I do need a shirt, um, so I'm going to have to buy one. Um, but I want to know where it came from. And even post buying it, you can write to H&M or you can write. And then I, I've done a lot of presentations at schools where kids, you know, in year five at the international school here. But what can we do? I say, write to the companies. Because you're the consumers of the future. And if you write to them saying, I'm worried about where the palm oil on my KitKat comes from, it, it lands. It lands. And and you don't and I always say, don't believe the rubbish they write on their website. Don't believe the glossy material they're going to send you. Because that's done by experts with vast amounts of money to tell you what they want you to know. We call it BS in Australia, but I'm trying to be polite. Don't listen to that rubbish. Ask questions, ask again, ask again, ask again. Um, not easy if you're a five year old, more easy if you're a, you know, if you're at a university in the Netherlands where you've got these more um, global view of the world, but ask questions. And, and, and I think this is what we're seeing now in the post, well, it's probably not post COVID yet, we're still in COVID, but we're seeing more and more people asking these questions. Like we got into this problem because we were deforesting and eating all of these animals, right? So. We don't want to do that again. Where are you getting your stuff from? We need the world to be a kinder place. And I think, you know, sometimes people say, so, you know, why are you talking to universities and why are you talking to schools? We need you, young people, to be asking these questions, not because we are abrogating our responsibility. And that does annoy me when I hear old people saying, oh, it's up to the young people now. No, it's not. We need to take our responsibility too. But um, the young people are seen to be the consumers of the future. And so when you write to a company, it has 10 times more impact than if I write to a company. And so getting the voice of the young people out there asking these questions and telling companies, we don't believe what you're saying, starts to create nervous breakdowns inside these companies. So we can write. So it comes back to my values. Don't just go and buy the shirt. Ask the questions. Do I want to be linked to a shirt that's been made with human rights abuses? And the answer is no. But I can tell you, as someone with all of my experience in these things, I don't know where this shirt came from. I cannot tell you. And that's why I was excited about this project, because I think the apparel industry is well uh, lag out. It's, it's well behind where some of these other industries are. So I think, you know, really fantastic that you know, you, you're all working on this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Do you maybe have an advice uh, for uh, for the groups, for the students in terms of uh, you know, output. I mean, the design of this uh, project is all about the question. And uh, as you said, you know, it's very important to ask questions and to formulate it, to understand the problems, uh, how complex they might be and how interconnected the different issues uh, actually can be. And uh, we were thinking uh, during also our last uh, discussion about maybe having like an ebook uh, that comes out of this uh, uh, experience uh, or having like uh, uh, videos uh, uh, to post on social media, maybe some experiments even, you know, uh, trying to uh, provoke maybe some reaction from people uh, asking, I don't know, outside, uh, uh, well, not now with COVID, but uh, outside of a shop to people what they think about uh, the goods that they've just been buying or mm -hmm. things like that. What would be your advice in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a type of output that you believe uh, will get attention? So interesting. Um, I, I, I became a vegan um, five years ago. I've lapsed during COVID to become vegetarian. But a lot of the reason was not because vegans yelled at me and told me how disgraceful I was for eating animals. And I think in that, that I use that as an example because I think vegans actually cause themselves, they damage their cause in some of the more aggressive way they try and convince people that they're evil. Um, my experience with these things and we go back to the duck um, and treating people with compassion and and not trying to shame people. If you try and we need to bring people together. And if you judge people and you shame them, you push them away because they don't want to be with someone who's judging them and shaming them. We need to bring them together 
so that we can share them information. So I would say um, one of the things that would be interesting, I believe, for the, the, the students to develop here um, would be a simple statement of values. Um, when, when, when we go and buy apparel, what do we want it to be? What do you know? What are the what are the what's our no deforestation commitment? What's our no exploitation commitment? What does it look like? And share that and try and the, the key the key essence of change, I believe, is to inspire people, not to make them feel bad. And the NGO campaigns only ever got so far because they shamed people. They told people they were bad. And so they would move away. OK, um, my job was to say, no, no, come on, it's all right. They don't really mean it. Let's come and talk together. The mediation role was about so much of it was about managing the pain and suffering of the person who had been shamed, the company that had been shamed. And so I think one of the things that students could do would be to think about how could we inspire people to understand what the issues are, to act in a way that's supportive of good practice and to and to keep it simple because if it's too complex the average person can't get it so it's almost like what might be a charter what's what's the student's charter for responsible apparel some simple guidelines and then how do you know whether your products that you're buying meet this charter and the answer will be today you probably can't know you probably won't know but then it can be what action can you take as a consumer to help fill those gaps in knowledge that we currently have, which are really big gaps in knowledge. We don't even know where this stuff comes from. How do we feel that? And so almost giving people a path to a better place, because these complex, these issues are so complex that even those of us who look at those supply chains, like, <laughs> I can't get my head around that. Uh, what about the person who's buying a shirt? They've got no chance. But what could we inspire them to do? What could we inspire them to do? Um, get them to sign on to, you know, the Avans Rotterdam Students Charter for Apparel. All right? Put that out there in the, in, the, in the public domain and social media and see if you can inspire people to sign on to it. Get your mum and your dad and your brothers and your sisters um, to, to sign on to this thing and, and write to H&M and write to the companies there that are selling these apparel things and say, we're a bit concerned that we don't really know where this is, but we want to inspire you to help us. So if we use that sort of language as opposed to the language of judgment and the language of shame, I think we can make progress. That's a great idea. And I think that some information is missing, but other information is there because we know which materials can be recycled more easily, which combinations, which uh, dyes. So uh, that's, that's a great idea, I think. Thanks. Yes, a beautiful, beautiful advice. Yes. yes. Because there'll be missing information. There's going to be missing gaps, but it's all right. We, Definitely, we yes. We got, we got that that's missing. We're not blaming you that it's missing, but we'd like you to take steps to fill that, to close that gap. We'd like the answer to that question. And, we'd and like there are companies that have done that yeah. as well. And then highlight those companies, like make yep. champions. Make champions. Yeah. Yep. And also it's a, a call for action uh, because it's a very active engagement. And that is yeah. something that we really want to stimulate uh, uh, also in, uh, in in the groups, but also on all you know uh, all, all the students. It's uh, really like more a movement. A movement, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and 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 come back to the duck, right? Yes. You can you can only control yourself. You can only speak passionately and inspiring in an inspiring way when you're connected to this place. So you know, one of the things that I always say to people is, you know, make sure you take plenty of walks in nature because that's how you get connected. Make sure, make sure you know you're taking care of yourself. I didn't. I I, I followed my path um, to the point where I could have dropped dead. Um, you've got to look after yourself, and that helps you stay connected. I was absolutely connected to who I was, but I neglected my own self care and my own um, well being. So get out in nature. So you know what I'd be saying to all of the students is, you know, factor in. Um, an hour or two walk in a park or or in a forest somewhere there um, and just get connected to that. Smell the flowers, touch the bark, listen to the birds, 
and then bring and that helps you stay here and then when you come back to write your assignment it'll be infused with that spirit because if you come back with indignation and anger and judgment and shame the people who read it will not only be not inspired they'll go in the opposite direction and you'll make it so much harder to bring them to you but if you come to them with love and 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 support and and inspiration who doesn't who wants to be linked to slave labor no one but if you say you're linked to slave labor it's like oh and you're a bad person as a result i scurry back off into the shadows but if I say, listen, there's a lot of slave labour in the apparel industry and there's all these sort of things going on and we're really trying to fix it. We, we need your help. Um, you know, could you, here's our charter. Um, we need to get that company there. Look, we've got this company here. Look at the steps they've taken. We'd love to hold them up as examples of good things. Oh, that'd be great. I'll sign on to that. Before you know it, you've got 10,000 signatures, you know, or, or whatever. You've got 10,000 followers on your Instagram page, for example. I, I, you know. I don't know what the metric is, but if you use that language of inspiration as opposed and, and the language of the duck, of your duck, not my duck, of who you are, you inspire people to come and they bring their duck. Yeah, I don't want to be linked to slave labour. I've got no idea if my shirt is, but I know I don't want to be. Okay, let's work on that. Let's let's use that. Well, I think in the in in Switzerland it's a lot easier to have a nice walk in the woods than in <laughs> South Holland. <laughs> well, you you have but you can always lucky. try. <laughs> very lucky. I'm very lucky, but you know. Yes. Yeah, I know what you mean. I do it. I do it uh, very often. It's I just, also we forget it. We forget yeah. these things, and um, yeah. it's, I think it probably saved my life that I was able to do that, and. Even though might I might have been in not a physical great condition because I was flying around the world and in these meetings and I was stressed all the time, it helped me stay connected. So that when I was in those meetings, and someone said something that was just you know really crazy, um, I didn't react with anger or I didn't react with judgment. I was able to say, I was able to almost look inwards and say, "Golly, that's a crazy. That's not going to work." let me talk to you about that as opposed to say oh that's the most stupidest thing i've ever heard <laughs> which is sometimes what i wanted to say but it was like no no i wouldn't say that because that's not compassion so you know what are your values you know my values we enshrined in the tft code of arms respect truth respect courage compassion and humility i don't always have the answer i'm not the one with the answer you're the one with the answer humility we all like to be heroes but it doesn't get us very far we need everyone to be a hero, everyone taking their choices. So these are this is just all part of this broad, different way of being, as I call it. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And there are a lot of interesting uh, posts uh, that uh, uh, you share uh, with, with the community, uh, Scott, also about your walks uh, with the dog uh, uh, yeah. in the forest. And that's really very nice and inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Anna. Yeah, it's it's just one of those things where I, you know I I, I you know, I'm contemplating the the community's new in a way. Um, you know, we set it up last June, but it took a while. We had summer. It took a while to get going, and I'm sort of just evolving what is shared there. I do I do encourage everyone to post and ask questions and um, you know come involved in the calls and things like that because um, it does it does seem to support people and help them and um and i think the community is going to evolve and grow and there's, there'll be more courses there there'll be more posts but anyone can post like you know the students can post i've got a question about this you know petru's question post it on the community you know we can yeah, we nice. can all support each other it's there to help it's there to be inspiring for people thank you yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So let's yeah. encourage uh, also all the students and all of us uh, to to take part in this uh, conversation and, and uh, to post and, and to share experiences, yeah. thoughts uh, and, you know, also ask a question uh, to, to, to get some shared feedback and, and sharing thoughts together. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you. I hope that's helpful. Are there any other questions? No questions. A last, I'll, I'll give you a last little thing before we break off. I used to do this when I was, I don't know why I used to do this. I, I look back and think it's a little bit strange. 
But, you know, when I was somewhere between around 10 and 12, 13, I discovered this strange practice of going into the bathroom and looking at myself in the eyes. And, and it's really difficult to go and absolutely look at yourself in the eyes, not to look at your face or your makeup or your hair, but to look at yourself in the eyes. And what happens when you first do that? is that all of the stupid things you did during the day come back to you. The nasty thing you said to your friend at school, this is when I was 10, um, the, 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 you know, the, the rude thing you said to your mum after she made your dinner, all of those things come back to you. And then after a little while, well, I was good when I played football with Mike, you know, and I did a great thing there. And so you start going over your day and you start – thinking about, well, I'm not going to do that tomorrow. That wasn't a good thing. I, I shouldn't have said that to Jenny or I shouldn't have said that to my dad or my mum. And what I found was initially I could do that for about a minute and I had to turn away. It was too much for me. Um, but by the time you get onto it and you start, and this is a way of looking inside yourself, after about 10 minutes it was like, I'm good. I'm okay. I know what I'm going to do tomorrow, and I'm not going to do that thing that was hurtful to that person. Um, I encourage people these days to I, – I have retreats and do things. I, I encourage people to do that practice. Not every day, a couple of times a week maybe or one, even once a week, and you start thinking, yeah, that's not who I am. I, I, I shouldn't have reacted in that way. Um, and I just, I just put, thought I'd suggest that and something that – we can all try, and um, it, it had a profound effect on my life. And then after a while, for some reason, I stopped doing it. But I've sort of started it again in the last year or so, and it's, it's quite powerful. Okay. And that's path to connection. I had a CEO once ask me, I did a presentation in Australia and uh, to a team of about 25 senior leaders, and the CEO was there. And at the end of the presentation, he said, I really get it. But, but how do you get connected? How do you do it? Like, <laughs> everyone has their own way, right, spending time in nature. And then I told him about this practice of looking in the mirror. But I said, you know, it's about reflection and just understanding who you are as a person and and don't just go blindly through life. Like, have a bit of your own VTTV. Like, what are my values? How am I going living according to them? What do I need to change? And what are my friends saying about my behaviour? Are they – did someone point out to me that – what I said to them hurt them. We are, we can all go through our own VTTV process um, and through that we can grow. Um, and in that growth, we can affect others. We get closer to the duck. Sounds very weird, but when you look at 37,000 hectares of palm oil, uh, of, of forest destroyed in Indonesia versus more than a million, it works. I think Thank the motto you. of yeah. uh, the uh, of the groups uh, can be to get close to the duck. <laughs> <laughs> I can share the. I'll email you the uh, the introduction to the. Please, a, that would be lovely. Question. Yes. Thank it's you. It's actually on my website. I, I read it out in on my website. It's actually on the. There's a page called a different way of being on my website. I think it's all there. Actually, that's probably the place to go. Beautiful. Thank you. Hope that's helpful. It is very helpful, I think, and very inspiring. And um, I'm sure that a lot of students will get inspired after they watch this recording. So. I'm having meetings with them this week, so um, I'll know <laughs> what the effect was <laughs> in Good. a few days. Let me know. It's always nice. Yeah, yeah we will uh, get back uh, also about you know how the the projects uh, evolve uh, and. Uh, and uh, the, the results of uh, this uh, this project. Yeah, and like I say, you know, whatever I can do to help. And um, if Thank if you. the students want to get involved on the pond community and ask questions, then it won't be just me. There's other people who are there on the community and they'll dive in with some, um, probably with some answers of their own. There's some pretty experienced people there. So, yeah. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Yes. Thank you so All much. Right. Very good to talk to you today. And um, we'll see you again soon. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, God.